Chapter Ten, Part One, of Equanimitas, by Sir William Osler. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Luke Sartor. Chapter Ten, British Medicine in Greater Britain. Cranmer. Nor shall this peace sleep with her, but as when the bird of wonder dies, the maiden phoenix, her ashes new create another air, as great in admiration as herself, so shall she leave her blessedness to one, when heaven shall call her from this cloud of darkness, who from the sacred ashes of her honour shall star-like rise, as great in fame as she was and so stand fixed peace plenty love truth terror that were the servants to this chosen infant shall then be his and like a vine grow to him wherever the bright sun of heaven shall shine his honour and the greatness of his name shall be and make new nations he shall flourish and like a mountain cedar reach his branches to all the plains about him. Our children's children shall see this, and bless heaven. King, thou speakest wonders. Shakespeare, King Henry the Eighth, Act Five. Chapter Ten, British Medicine in Greater Britain. Given at the British Medical Association. Montreal, 1897. To trace successfully the evolution of any one of the learned professions would require the hand of a master, of one who, like Darwin, combined a capacity for patient observation with philosophic vision. In the case of medicine, the difficulties are enormously increased by the extraordinary development which has taken place during the 19th century. The rate of progress has been too rapid for us to appreciate, and we stand bewildered, and, as it were, in a state of intellectual giddiness, when we attempt to obtain a broad, comprehensive view of the subject. In a safer, middle flight, I propose to dwell on certain of the factors which have moulded the profession in English-speaking lands beyond the narrow seas of British medicine in Greater Britain. Even for this lesser task, though my affiliations are wide and my sympathies deep, I recognize the limitations of my fitness and am not unaware that in my ignorance I shall overlook much which might have rendered less sketchy a sketch necessarily imperfect. Evolution advances by such slow and imperceptible degrees that to those who are part of it, the finger of time scarcely seems to move. Even the great epochs are seldom apparent to the participators. During the last century, neither the colonists nor the mother country appreciated the thrilling interest of the long-fought duel for the possession of this continent. The acts and scenes of the drama to them detached, isolated, and independent, now glide like dissolving views into each other. And in the vitoscope of history, we can see the true sequence of events. That we can meet here today, Britons on British soil in a French province, is one of the far-off results of that struggle. This was but a prelude to the other great event of the 18th century, the revolt of the colonies and the founding of a second great English-speaking nation, in the words of Bishop Berkeley's prophecy, Time's noblest offspring. It is surely a unique spectacle that a century later, descendants of the actors of these two great dramas should meet in an English city in New France. Here the American may forget Yorktown in Louisbourg, the Englishman Bunker Hill in Quebec, and the Frenchman both Louisbourg and Quebec, in Chateauguay, while we Canadians, English and French, 
remembering former friendships and forgetting past enmities, can welcome you to our country, the land in which and for which you have so often fought. Once and only once, before in the history of the world, could such a gathering as this have taken place. Divided though the Greeks were, a Hellenic sentiment of extraordinary strength united them in certain assemblies and festivals. No great flight of imagination is required to picture a notable representation of our profession in the 5th century B.C., meeting in such a colonial town as Agrigentum, under the presidency of Empedocles, delegates from the mother cities, brilliant predecessors of Hippocrates, of the stamp of Democides and Herodicus, delegates from the sister colonies of Syracuse and other Sicilian towns, from neighboring Italy, from far distant Massilia, and from still more distant Pantisapium and Istria. And in such an assemblage there would have been men capable of discussing problems of life and mind more brilliantly than in many subsequent periods, in proportion as the pre-Hippocratic philosophers in things medical had thought more deeply than many of those who came after them. We English are the modern Greeks, and we alone have colonized as they did, as free peoples. There have been other great colonial empires, Phoenician, Roman, Spanish, Dutch, and French. But in civil liberty and intellectual freedom, Magna Graecia and Greater Britain stand alone. The parallel so often drawn between them is of particular interest with reference to the similarity between the Greek settlements in Sicily and the English plantations on the Atlantic coast. Indeed, Freeman says, I can never think of America without something suggesting Sicily, or of Sicily without something suggesting America. I wish to use the parallel only to emphasize two points, one of difference and one of resemblance. The Greek colonist took Greece with him, Hellas had no geographical bounds. Massilia and Olbia were cities of Hellas, in as full sense as Athens or Sparta. While the emigrant Britons changed their sky, not their character, in crossing the great sea, yet the homestayers had never the same feeling toward the plantations as the Greeks had toward the colonial cities of Magna Graecia. If as has been shrewdly surmised, Professor Seeley was Herodotus reincarnate. How grieved the spirit of the father of history must have been to say of Englishmen. Nor have we even now ceased to think of ourselves as simply a race inhabiting an island off the northern coast of the continent of Europe. The assumption of gracious superiority, which, unless carefully cloaked, smacks just a little of our national arrogance, is apt to jar on sensitive colonial nerves, with the expansion of the empire, and the supplanting of a national by an imperial spirit. This will become impossible. That this sentiment never prevailed in Hellas, as it did later in the Roman Empire, was due largely to the fact that in literature, in science, and in art, the colonial cities of Greece early overshadowed the mother cities. It may be because the settlements of Greater Britain were of slower growth that it took several generations and several bitter trials to teach a lesson the Greeks never had to learn. The Greek spirit was the leaven of the old world, the workings of which no nationality could resist. Thrice it saved Western civilization for it had the magic power of leading captivity captive and making even captive conquerors the missionaries of her culture. What modern medicine owes to it will appear later. The love of science, the love of art, the love of freedom, vitally correlated to each other and brought into organic union, were the essential attributes of the Greek genius. 
while we cannot claim for the anglo-saxon race all of these distinctions it has in a higher degree that one which in practical life is the most valuable and which has been the most precious gift of the race to the world the love of freedom of freedom in her regal seat of england it would carry me too far afield to discuss the differences between the native Briton and his children, scattered so widely up and down the earth, in Canada, South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand. Types of the Anglo-Saxon race are developing which will differ as much from each other and from the English as the American does today from the original stock. But amid these differences can everywhere be seen those race qualities which have made us what we are. Courage, national integrity, steady good sense, and energy in work. At a future meeting of the association, perhaps in Australia, a professional, Sir Charles Dilke, with a firm grasp of the subject, may deal with the medical problems of Greater Britain in a manner worthy of the address in medicine. My task, as I mentioned at the outset, is much less ambitious. Could someone with full knowledge patiently analyze the characteristics of British medicine, he would find certain national traits sufficiently distinct for recognition. Three centuries cannot accomplish very much, and that period has only just passed since the revival of medicine in England. But the local conditions of isolation which have been singularly favourable to the development of special peculiarities in the national character, have not been without effect in the medical profession. I cannot do more than touch upon a few features, which may be useful as indicating the sources of influence upon Great Britain in the past, and which may perhaps be suggestive as to lines of progress in the future. Above the fireplace, in Sir Henry Eckland's library are three panelled portraits of Lineker, Sydenham, and Harvey. The scroll upon them reads Literas, Praxis, Scientia. To this great triumvirate, as to the fountain heads, we may trace the streams of inspiration which have made British medicine what it is today. Lineker, the type of the literary physician, must ever hold a unique place in the annals of our profession. To him was due in great measure the revival of Greek thought in the 16th century in England, and in the last Harveyan oration, Dr. Payne has pointed out his importance as a forerunner of Harvey. He made Greek methods available. Through him the art of Hippocrates and the science of Galen became once more the subject of careful, first-hand study. Lineker, as Dr. Payne remarks, was possessed from his youth till his death by the enthusiasm of learning. He was an idealist, devoted to objects which the world thought of little use. Painstaking, accurate, critical, hypercritical, perhaps, he remains today the chief literary representative of British medicine. Neither in Britain nor in Greater Britain have we maintained the place in the world of letters created for us by Lineker's noble start. It is true that in no generation since has the profession lacked a man who might stand unabashed in the temple at Delos, but, judged by the fruits of learning, scholars of his type have been more common in France and Germany. Nor is it to our credit that so little provision is made for the encouragement of these studies. For years, the reputation of Great Britain in this matter was sustained almost alone by the great Deeside scholar, the surgeon of Bancori, Francis Adams, the interpreter of Hippocrates to English students. In the 19th century, he and Greenhill well maintained the traditions of Lineker. Their work, and that of a few of our contemporaries, among whom Ogle must be specially mentioned, has kept us in touch with the ancients. But by the neglect of the study of the humanities, 
which has been far too general, the profession loses a very precious quality. While in critical scholarship and in accurate historical studies, British medicine must take a second place. The influence of Linacre, exerted through the Royal College of Physicians and the old universities, has given to the humanities an important part in education, so that they have moulded a larger section of the profession than in any other country. A physician may possess the science of Harvey and the art of Sydenham, and yet there may be lacking in him those finer qualities of heart and head which count for so much in life. Pasture is not everything, and that indefinable, though well understood, something which we know as breeding is not always an accompaniment of great professional skill. Medicine is seen at its best in men whose faculties have had the highest and most harmonious culture. The Lathams, the Watsons, the Pagets, the Jenners, and the Gairdners have influenced the profession less by their special work than by exemplifying those graces of life and refinements of heart which make up character. And the men of this stamp in Greater Britain have left the most enduring mark, Beaumont, Bovell, and Hodder in Toronto, Holmes, Campbell, and Howard in this city, the Warrens, the Jacksons, the Bigelows, the Bowditches, and the Shaddocks in Boston, Bard, Hossack, Francis, Clark, and Flint of New York, Morgan, Shippen, Redman, Rush, Cox, the Elder Wood, the Elder Pepper, and the Elder Mitchell of Philadelphia, Brahmins all, in the language of the greatest Brahmin among them, Oliver Wendell Holmes. These and men like unto them have been the leaven which has raised our profession above the dead level of business. The Literae Humaniores, represented by Linacre, revived Greek methods, but the faculty during the 16th and at the beginning of the 17th centuries was in a sloth of ignorance and self-conceit, and not to be aroused even by Moses and the prophets, in the form of Hippocrates and the fathers of medicine. In the pictures referred to, Sydenham is placed between Linacre and Harvey, but science preceded practice, and Harvey's great Lumleian lectures were delivered before Sydenham was born. Linacre has been well called, by Payne, Harvey's intellectual grandfather. The discovery of the circulation of the blood was the climax of that movement, which began a century and a half before with the revival of Greek medical classics, and especially of Galen. Harvey returned to Greek methods and became the founder of modern experimental physiology and the great glory of British scientific medicine. The demonstration of the circulation of the blood remains in every detail a model research. I shall not repeat the oft-told tale of Harvey's great and enduring influence, but I must refer to one feature which, until lately, has been also a special characteristic of his direct successes in Great Britain. Harvey was a practitioner and a hospital physician. There are gossiping statements by Aubrey to the effect that he fell mightily in his practice after the publication of the De Motu Cordis, and that his therapeutic way was not admired but to these his practical success is the best answer. It is remarkable that a large proportion of all the physiological work of Great Britain has been done by men who have become successful hospital physicians or surgeons. I was much impressed by a conversation with Professor Ludwig in 1884. Speaking of the state of English physiology, he lamented the lapse of a favourite English pupil from science to practice. But, he added, while sorry for him, I am glad for the profession in England. 
he held that the clinical physicians of that country had received a very positive impress from the work of their early years in physiology and the natural sciences. I was surprised at the list of names which he cited. Among them I remember Bowman, Paget, Savary, and Lister. Ludwig attributed this feature in part to the independent character of the schools in England, to the absence of the university element so important in medical life in Germany, but above all, to the practical character of the English mind, the better men preferring an active life in practice to a secluded laboratory career. Thucydides, it was, who said of the Greeks that they possessed the power of thinking before they acted, and of acting, too. The same is true in a higher degree of the English race. To know just what has to be done, then to do it, comprises the whole philosophy of practical life. Sydenham, Anglaeus Lumen, as he has been well called, is the model practical physician of modern times. Lineker led Harvey back to Galen, Sydenham, to Hippocrates. The one took Greek science, the other not so much Greek medicine as Greek methods, particularly intellectual fearlessness, and a certain knack of looking at things. Sydenham broke with authority and went to nature. It is an extraordinary fact that he could have been so emancipated from dogmas and theories of all sorts. He laid down the fundamental proposition, and acted upon it, that all diseases should be described as objects of natural history. To do him justice, we must remember, as Dr. John Brown says, in the midst of what a mass of errors and prejudices, of theories actively mischievous, he was placed at a time when the mania of hypothesis was at its height and when the practical part of his art was overrun and stultified by vile and silly nostrums. Sydenham led us back to Hippocrates. I would that we could be led oftener to Sydenham. How necessary to bear in mind what he says about the method of the study of medicine. In writing, therefore, such a natural history of disease, every merely philosophical hypothesis should be set aside, and the manifest and natural phenomena, however minute, should be noted with the utmost exactness. The usefulness of this procedure cannot be easily overrated, as compared with the subtle inquiries and trifling notions of modern writers, for can there be a shorter, or indeed any other way of coming at the morbific causes, or discovering the curative indications than by a certain perception of the peculiar symptoms? By these steps and helps, it was that the father of physic, the great Hippocrates, came to excel, his theory being no more than an exact description or view of nature. He found that nature alone often terminates diseases, and works a cure with a few simple medicines and often enough with no medicines at all. Well, indeed, has a recent writer remarked, Sydenham is unlike every previous teacher of the principles and practice of medicine in the modern world. He, not Lineker or Harvey, is the model British physician in whom were concentrated all those practical instincts upon which we lay such stress in the Anglo-Saxon character. The Greek faculty which we possess of thinking and acting has enabled us, in spite of many disadvantages, to take the lion's share in the great practical advances in medicine. Three among the greatest scientific movements of the century have come from Germany and France. Bichat, Lenec, and Lewis laid the foundation of modern clinical medicine. Virchow and his pupils of scientific pathology, while Pasteur and Koch, have revolutionized the study of the causes of disease, and yet the modern history of the art of medicine 
could almost be written in its fullness from the records of the anglo-saxon race we can claim every practical advance of the very first rank vaccination anesthesia preventive medicine and antiseptic surgery the captain jewels in the carcanet of the profession beside which can be placed no others of equal luster one other lesson of sydenham's life needs careful conning the english hippocrates as i said broke with authority his motto was thou nature art my goddess to thy law my services are bound undue reverence for authority as such a serene satisfaction with the status quo and a fatuous objection to change have often retarded the progress of medicine in every generation in every country there have been and ever will be laudatores temporis acti in the bad sense of that phrase not a few of them men in high places who have lent the weight of a complacent conservatism to bolster up an ineffectual attempt to stay the progress of new ideas every innovator from harvey to lister has been made to feel its force the recently issued life of thomas wakeley is a running commentary on this spirit against the pricks of which he kicked so hard and so effectually but there are signs of a great change End of chapter 10 part 1 this recording is by Luke Sartor, Griffith, New South Wales.